everyone, and welcome to the Mountainside Podcast. Our guest for this episode is Donnie Dust. He spends most of his time primitively living off the land in the backcountry and is considered the professional caveman. He has also starred on the reality TV show Alone and now runs Paleo Track Survival School, teaching individuals how to primitively live and survive in the wilderness. Donnie is a great human being. I've thoroughly enjoyed sitting down and talking to him, and I can't wait for you to listen. What's up, Donnie Dust, man? (laughs) Welcome to uh, the Mountainside Podcast. You are a professional caveman, <laughs> and I couldn't be more excited to have you on the show, man. Uh, you know, we're a total outdoor show. We cover everything from mountain biking to rock climbing to bow hunting, fishing, mountain safety, yeah. and you kind of encompass just all of that. So super stoked to have you, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, This is uh, this is exciting. It absolutely is. I've heard of you guys, and I'm... I've, I, uh, this is part of the community and the world that I walk in, so it comes in many different sh- ways, shapes, and forms. So yeah, yeah and you brought a, another guest with you, right? Yeah, I yeah. brought I brought my uh, my recently rescued dog Finn, um, who is slowly becoming a mountain dog just through you know gentle immersion. But uh, yeah, he's getting comfortable with some of the caves, and we were running through rivers today, so he'll he'll be chasing rabbits and stalking elk before you know it. So awesome. Out. So you're freshly coming out of the bush, right? Like you were up there. Yeah. So I was up for a couple of days. I came down for a day. Um, and then I had like a couple appointments, specifically this. Oh, okay. Awesome. Well, <laughs> so thanks yeah, for coming out no, of the woods no, for us, My man. pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then I'll head back up uh, probably on Sunday evening or either early Monday morning. And just Monday will be a block for my own personal time. I got to get out every once in a while and take a break from teaching and in writing and doing a lot of different things and just put the loincloth on, strap yeah. the dog and take off into the bush. And it's, you know, hunting season's around the corner. So, oh, I know. So I'm, this is, this is it. I'm a nervous wreck because I've spent so much time on the podcast <laughs> and normally right now I'm rocking like crazy, yeah. right? Because a lot of the places where I'm, I hunt or where I can kill an elk that I know of yeah. are deep, dark holes, right? Exactly. <laughs> you, so you got to carry them out of there. Yeah. And, uh, you keep those safe too. You don't yeah. share too much. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I will never mention it on this podcast. Yeah, so. Yeah. so yeah, but, uh, but yeah, no, I'm getting super excited about that. It's kind of crazy with all the fires going I on. I'm yeah. wondering what, you know, that's actually made me change some of my plans. For sure. I'm going to a plan B spot now uh, just because of everything that's going on, man. And yeah. there's, I think there's a few more that sparked today, too, which is crazy. Yeah, they're all through the corridor from, I know, all the way out to Grand Junction, pretty much, I think it was... Um, all through Rifle, Glenwood Canyon, the whole area. I mean, I pulled yeah. Unit 33, which is just north of Rifle. I'm not going to be able to get to it. Right. It's yeah, all... that's normally where I hunt is yeah. up, like, flat tops area, yeah, exactly. that sort of thing. And No go. I'm just not going to chance it. You know, I just no. go someplace else. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, animals aren't going to be acting properly. They're going to be all spooked. They're going to be hitting their hard push. They're going to be going all these different directions. And it right. kind of takes a different aspect of like hunting in that capacity. If It if really it, does. Cause they're already distressed a yeah. little bit. And yeah. It, yeah so. so, but yeah. Uh, so where'd you get your dog and how, how'd you find her, him, right? Him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been wanting a dog for, you know, quite some time and it would just seem like the right time. I, I, I relocated to be closer to my kids and I have a little place and, uh, you know, I, I just need that kind of constant companion with me 24-7, someone that I can sleep on the floor with, and he won't have an issue. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I just I found a rescue and uh, reached out to a local rescue in Aurora, and they uh, they said they had a couple dogs, and I went and checked them out. And that was awesome. It. Yeah, super cool-looking dog. It's a mix between a husky and a pit bull? Or? Yeah, yeah, they called it a, they called a pitsky. Um, uh-huh. Pit bull, husky, I think he's got maybe some German shepherd in him, but he's just... He looks more like a coyote from behind, and then when he's facing you, he looks kind of like a pit bull. So I bring him to the dog park. Everyone kind of has their comments on what he is. Right. But uh, I'm just – he's he's a he's mutt. He's a dog. He's a, he's a dog. He's <laughs> yeah. a mutt. He was he's found your on the, dog. Yeah, he's, a, yeah, he's my dog. He was yeah. found on the streets kind of surviving, eating roadkill and stuff. So we already have a bond. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Carla, actually, our woman behind the curtain today that's yeah. helping us out, she's got a Pitsky as well. Oh, so, really yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. This, I, you know, I've never heard of Pitskys, you know, in the actual breed, but, you know, now I'm learning a little bit more about them. They're pretty smart dogs, loyal dogs, very energetic and active. So, I think I might have lucked out with Finn. Yeah. So yeah, it goes. sounds like it's going to be the perfect mountain dog, yeah, too. So. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> It'll be pulling quarters out before you know it. <laughs> awesome. So, you've been. You probably really haven't had too much issues with this whole COVID-19 thing because you're pretty much social distanced. Pretty much. <laughs> what, three quarters of the year? You're yeah. probably outdoors? Yeah, next to Sasquatch, I'm probably a social distancing <laughs> master. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, when it all kind of kicked off, there was no real change in my pattern of life. I was still going out in the bush, and it was kind of kind of kicking off in that February, March time frame. But um yeah, there wasn't a, a big lull in fire as far as my activities. I just kind of did what I normally did, and where people were, that's not where I was going. So, and usually, a lot of the caves and a lot of the locations I kind of roam through, there's no population. I mean, you will come across roads and you'll see things in the distance, but you just avoid it at all costs. So, social distancing's kind of been my my thing. You were for, used to it already. Yeah, there was no issues. What I'm curious about is how many people have you had hit you up for the, like, I got all this free time because you run a survival school. Correct? I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I run a school called uh, paleo track survival, which is kind of the, 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 the title in terms is kind of the old way, so to speak, the old paths. And the idea is to kind of, um, know that everything can kind of come from nature. Creativity is our number one survival skill and we should be kind of led by curiosity. And with that kind of, we embrace a wilderness self-reliance through knowledge, skills, and abilities and understanding that the natural world provides all and will continue to provide all. So if we find ourselves in an emergency situation, um, the natural world will assist us and provide everything that we need as well as if I choose to go out and kind of reduce my overall load uh, as far as maybe a pack and a tent the natural world will provide everything that I need. So even when it comes to like bow hunting, um, I hunt with a primitive bow. I got a quiver full of arrows that uh, is made from an otter. I usually go barefoot or a homemade pair of sandals, sometimes a loincloth or a cut off jean shorts because I like to, you know, church it up a little bit. And, uh, yeah, man. you know, I head out in the bush and, and go do what I got to do. That's, that's so awesome. That's, I mean, that's really what drew my attention to you and kind of how I found you was some of the primitive tools that you do. And yeah. Some of the craftsmanship that goes into that is just truly amazing to me. I appreciate um, it. I've always been fascinated by it. I grew up in a family, you know, that uh, we spent a lot of time in South Park finding those tools from primitive people and yeah. and stuff like that. And uh, to see your work and how how well, because you can really tell the the difference of craftsmen when you pick up an arrowhead right sure some of them are just like napped out real quick and maybe it's because they were in wartime or maybe they had, the buffalo herd was moving through real yeah. quick so it's just like a quick like get it done and then you can find some that are like super just these beautiful works of art right yeah. Yeah, and for uh, sure. i think that that was kind of in the primitive day that was from the books that i've read and stuff that was kind of their signature and um it's kind of funny, like even some of the guys that uh, at one book that I was reading, it might have been Empire of the Summer Moon or something like that. Um, there was a guy that was really awesome at napping. Like he just made the most beautiful arrowheads and spearheads and yeah. tools and, it, you know, hand tools and all this stuff. But he had trouble hunting and his brother <laughs> couldn't make shit, but could kill anything yeah. and everything right <laughs> yeah that's awesome you bring that up there's um i worked on a film a couple of years ago called napper and that was kind of the general premise where you know it's it's the idea that the the starving artist right so even in earlier times the napper who builds these beautiful works of art from stone is reluctant to shoot them if he's not a good hunter because they'll break so ultimately starving uh, artists and same thing like, you know, and maybe an artist, they create some sort of work of art and they love it so much. They don't want it to go anywhere. They want to look at it and enjoy it themselves. Right. And henceforth, they, they starve. But yeah. And that same sort of uh, story, the brother was the hunter. He could nap but made really horrible points. And his idea was just sticking it inside of the animal. But there was more of a, you know, kind of a, a magical approach between the napper and how he wanted to hunt and why he was wanting to hunt and the idea behind his Oh, there's some of your work right tools. there, man. Yeah, That's, thank sure. you, Carla. That's awesome. Yeah, my my journey into stone has been one, um, you know, it's taken several years. This, you know, lithic arts, flint napping is, 
it's hard to do. So a lot of people will start it and they run into a lot of issues and problems and just kind of realize how difficult it is. And then they kind of toss it to the side. And for those of us that do nap, it's, it's the idea of saying that you're creating a piece of history. You know, you, you can replicate the past, but you're also creating something that is organic today, a piece of history for today. So if like for me, my idea behind stone tools is never want to be able to create, you know, Clovis points and Dalton points, all these various styles of points I can, mm -hmm. but the idea is to create the tools that I need today. Because I, I, I prefer to use stone tools, whether it's processing out an elk or, um, you know, a bison up in Montana. I, I want to use those stone tools. It slows you down. You connect with the animal and exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. And it gives you a whole different kind of outlook into hunting and then living remotely and just kind of being in one with the, the natural world. So it's it's a good journey. It really is. That's so cool, man, because I am the exact opposite. Like, I, <laughs> I've always had a passion to maybe traditionally bow hunt, but sure. I just never put enough time behind the riser, right? Yeah. Because it takes some time to, to shoot traditionally. So I, I've got it so easy, right? You got the compound bow <laughs> with the sights, and yeah. you got, uh, you know, these amazing knives that my buddy makes. And yeah. just, I mean, really, really all the right tools, right? And you got a Garmin, you know, yeah. I still carry a map with me. But <laughs> yeah. you got all these things to mark waypoints and stuff. So I call it being the ultimate predator. But connecting with nature is a whole nother thing right sure. so i going i really admire what you do and oh, i think it's it. so cool and i think if people have the time they should totally come learn from you man. <laughs> okay. no, and yeah. I, I hope to someday no i appreciate sure. it yeah absolutely my doors are and caves are always open and that's <laughs> that's the idea is that um just kind of accepting that everything can come from the bush you know whether it's food it's water shelter everything really comes from it it has been that way longer than what we have now. I mean, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, everything came from the natural world. And we kind of lost that. So myself and there's other you know folks out there that are trying to reconnect and rewild people to that natural way, whether it's through hunting or foraging or just living more remotely, living more simplistically in the natural world and kind of identifying what it brings to you. Yeah, because I feel like everybody including myself do you just get caught up in this game where oh i need this or i need that or i need the newest iphone or i need that but sure. really you don't you know like, yeah you don't need any of that shit <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's it's real i mean i always like to say i just moved from one spot to another and as i was moving in i realized i had nothing i had more animal hides and skulls and stonework than i had couches and tvs and chairs and then it's it came, not a bad thing. No, <laughs> it really wasn't. But as I was looking, you know, at my two sons, they were kind of like, "What's where are we going?" I'm like, "I'll get you guys beds. Don't worry." You know, right? But it's it's just you know, kind of a less is more simplistic sort of way of life of just saying, "All right, this is what I need. These are the things I want. How can I obtain those things that I want? And do I really need those things that I want? And if you don't, then you just say, "Well, I'll go find it somewhere else, or I'll go find something else that kind of drives me." And curiosity is always my my guiding force if you see something in the bush or you hear a noise or you smell something like what is it i want to go see what it is i want to go find out what it is exactly and i go yeah if it takes five days it takes 10 days or 30 minutes i'm still going are you uh while you're out in the bush um are you keeping track of time and or is it just kind of a feeling or how does that yeah you know when it comes to like bush time if i have specifics i have you know in the future or something like that i'll kind of manage that accordingly but one of the tenets i like to have is never really having a plan and i know for an outdoor podcast it's like having a plan is the most important thing like let people know where you're going and all these all that is 100 well you're true. so experienced in being in the outdoors right and yeah. you can survive with primitive tools absolutely and, and with uh man-made blankets and and stuff like that For right sure. or natural blankets yeah, right absolutely. Yeah, so grass woven yeah you know, like you have uh, a whole buffet of different foods that people would walk by every day and probably not eat right sure. like you probably know we're going to get into that a little bit more <laughs> yeah but uh but yeah i think that if if you're not like for me bow hunting for example you got to go with what you're comfortable with for sure if if you don't have somebody experienced like you with you right absolutely and it's that level of comfort and then that gives you safe that's it's also a false sense of safety but it yeah. does give you safety at the same time so yeah i always stress that about like gps's and there's all these gps watches and yeah. all this shit now right but if the battery dies on it what are you going to do yeah, you still got to know how to 
to navigate yep. somehow. So yep. landmarks, compass, map, waypoints, you know, like Absolutely. all that sort of stuff is it's good to know that primitive side or what happens if you get stranded, you lost your rifle in a bear fight, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> whatever yeah. it was. Right. Yeah. And uh, nobody's coming to get you in the middle of Alaska or Canada. Yeah. You got to know how to survive know somehow. It. Right. So no, it's that's that's the truth. I mean, I, I break it down to high tech and then low tech and then no tech. And you have to kind of operate within those three little um, praxis for the most part. So me, I like to kind of hang in that no tech to low tech. So maybe I'll be going out for a couple of days but I'll bring a water filter because I know it's the water's not as popular or, you know, it's not a rainy season or the streams are kind of dried up. But the water I do find is going to be a little bit harder to process. So that comes in experience, spending time out in the outdoors and understanding the environments you're operating in. Even like right now with Colorado with all the fires, if I'm going out for a couple of days, I can't light a fire to boil water or even potentially cook food. So what do I have to do? I have to kind of go to a more of a foraging aspect and maybe – I will bring a water filter with me to help sure. you. So you kind of find out those different practices you operate in, and then you kind of grow your planet, but it really comes down to your knowledge, skills, and abilities. And we are self-deceivers, so we will deceive ourselves and our own abilities. Oh, thinking, tell oh, me about yeah, it. It's a 14er. I've got that. No issues. <laughs> I did Pike's Peak or I did Evans, you know, and then, you know, it's September timeline. You're like, I think I can hit the timeline. And before you know it, weather changes temps drop a little yeah. moisture hits the air and you're going hypothermic up on top of that the, kills a lot of people it, it kills more people than animals do i yeah, think wild absolutely. animals do and stuff like that and lightning absolutely. is a, another big one you know so when those microbursts come in oh, or gosh. snowstorm Snow you can storm. really get in trouble in a hurry and i think that that's probably in my opinion the time that i've spent above tree line hunting and and stuff like that and it that has definitely been the scariest moments I've ever had is when there's a thunderstorm yeah. or <clears throat> weather comes in because it, it comes in out of nowhere. Yeah. And it's kind of a it's a false sense of security because sometimes you can see it and you'll judge and be like, I think I got like 45 minutes before it hits. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just push a little farther. And next thing you know, it's on top of you. And you're like, all right, that was the dumbest call. Yeah. And then you start shivering. But yeah, I think that's kind of how we learn, though, as well unfortunately. So I got to ask, <laughs> yeah. have you always been this way? Like from a child, were you in the woods? I mean, yeah. what sh can you go into your background a little yeah, bit? Absolutely. I don't know much about that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious. So I, I grew up uh, for the most part in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, when there was very few homes and you could still kind of walk out your door and walk to like Chatfield and it wasn't a reservoir. It was just where you went to fish and catch trout and crawdads. So I was very much an outdoor kid. Um, I'm 40 years old, so you know you didn't really have a lot of the technology and the things that keep you inside. My parents would warn me if you keep you know catching snakes and doing these things, you're going to get stuck inside. Now it's the opposite <laughs> for kids. I'm going to send you outside, but right. um, yeah. So I spent a lot of time in Colorado skiing and climbing and hiking. Um, that was just that normal Colorado pattern of life for a lot of us. And then um, I moved to Illinois and I went was there for two years. And then my father took a job in New York, and we wound up living in New Jersey. So I did four wow. years. Yeah, so it was like New Jersey proper, or like no, like down by the um, in the southern areas, kind of like along the water and stuff. Okay, um, I don't want to say the Jersey Shore because that's like yeah. not necessarily <laughs> the the most accurate. There place. are some beautiful mountain spots in New Jersey. Yeah, actually, I mean, you know, yeah, so. the Pine Barrens is beautiful. Yeah. You got all you know the the Poconos, the Appalachian Trail runs through there as well. So I mean, it's a very beautiful. It's known as a garden state. So um, right. But I spent four years there, and then I enlisted in the uh, United States Marine Corps. And Oh, really? Yeah, so the idea was uh, I did not – I was not a school guy. All I wanted to do was be running around in the woods and, you know, paddling and climbing. And one day I walked into a recruiting office, and they were like, do you like camping, fishing, hiking, and all these sorts of things? I said, well, yeah, absolutely. He goes, well, all right, well, you should think about signing up. And I was like, done. I'm, I was 19. I signed up, and within, like, three months I was out the door. Wow. And then, uh, yeah, I found myself all over the world. And the Marine Corps really gave me a lot of opportunities to, one, experience new cultures, two, find a kind of an appreciation in how they lived and a respect to how they lived. And then it gave me a lot of exposure points. So I've lived with uh, Bedouin tribes. I've lived with jungle clans. I've lived with a variety of people through my different jobs in the military. And from that, um, there was always a kind of a fostering and a pushing saying if you're very much in tune with these survival schools because they would send you so 
I got to live with some Thai Marines for like 30 plus days, one, one, a one-on-one -on -one sort of thing where I lived in a jungle and we chased monkeys and caught fish and ate rice and we did all this thing, these, you know, jungle sort of living and it just gave me different perspectives. So the military really allowed me and fostered my love of the outdoors and that kind of curiosity of the land and put me in great places like I lived in Okinawa, Japan. I lived in Hawaii. I lived all up and down the East Coast, the West Coast. Spent some time overseas in various areas. Those are all great spots. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, from Malaysia, Indonesia, Borneo, uh, Thailand, Singapore, Australia. I don't know how many times. Um, just awesome. all over the world. So it really, you know, it, it gave me that drive to just keep going and keep going. And then, you know, um, one day I kind of just I had enough. I spent a lot of time overseas, and I started to create a family, and I wanted to be around more. And um, it was just time to go. So I did 12 years and then uh, got out and I said, all right, you're going to do what makes you happy. And I kind of created my, my, my pathway like an official business. And uh, from there, it's just kind of been nonstop. So it's, it's always been a thing, but it's been different facets. And I like, <clears throat> you know, people always ask like, so how many years experience do you have in this? And I always like to kind of say I have one year experience. I have one year a different year every year. I don't want 30 years, 20 years experience of the same year. That'd be extremely boring. And just, what are you really learning? So, you're stuck in a rut. Yeah, you're, you're stuck, stuck in the rat, rat exactly. race, right? Exactly. I get so, that. That's so cool, man. I've never yeah. really thought about it that way. Yeah, so. so when you break it down, it's like, what am I doing this year that's going to make me better? It's going to build into whether it's a business or a lifestyle or an outlook on life. And that's been my, my constant. Like, what am I doing this year? Because that's my one year of experience so sure. sometimes you get weird looks like one year experience like let me just let me get 30 <laughs> seconds let me explain it to you you know but right yeah it works out i um i love what i do uh you know i get to wake up and determine my my kind of general pathway what what am i going to do today what am i doing next week in the month and you know for example um at the end of September and October, I'm going to go work on another feature film. Um, I'm going to go to Ohio the first two weeks of September and work with you know a family out there on their farm. Then I'm going to link up with a buddy that's a flint napping buddy, and we're going to do some flint napping. So you get to pick and manage your own kind of pathways. You know, I don't want to say you got to put the hard work in, but you have to kind of devote some time and efforts to establish a good foundation. Then you start to kind of grow from there. For me, that's. That's kind of where I'm at now. I've, at that, I've hit that growth point, and now it's run and play and go live in the woods for That's you know, so awesome, man, because I think so many people just get stuck in like, okay, I got to go to my cubicle, yeah. and first, before I get to my cubicle, I'm going to rush to Starbucks, and then <laughs> once I get out of work, I'm going to run to the gym, and I'm yeah. going to work out real quick, and then I'm going to go home and go to bed so I can do it all over again, right? And it's, uh, it's never been the case for me. I've always had kind of these odd careers that led me down – travel the world and just yeah. work all these really odd jobs but uh so i feel f super fortunate that i never really fell into that yeah and uh but man i really admire what you do because it's a whole nother level of oh, just like it. freedom yeah you know it's 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 a it's a freedom i think is obtainable for everyone i think what we have to do is we have to start kind of eliminating the things we we think we need there's there's a lot of like insecurities when we don't have stuff like whether it's a car or this that or the other and i like to always use like, and it really doesn't mean shit it doesn't mean anything yeah. not a damn thing <laughs> not a damn like i always use i don't sleep in a bed i've been sleeping on the floor even when i was married for a time i typically start in the bed and then i'd wind up laying on the floor next to my dog at that time but yeah <laughs> and it's those sort of things that I, my my body my mind my spirit is just aligned to that and i feel a different sort of connection to that even when it comes to like having you know a television or it comes to having a phone like a phone for me is a business connection resource yeah and you almost you almost hate to say it, you got to have one and nowadays it. and you're pretty much a celebrity on <laughs> on instagram or like uh we're gonna get into that a little bit Bad more orders. because you've been on some reality tv shows Correct. and stuff like that and you Correct. work in film now but yep. so i get it you got to stay connected and i'm glad that you are because I think that that really inspires people that maybe have that cubicle job mm -hmm. to like Balance. open their eyes a little bit and be like, well, maybe I could just go do this on the weekends yeah. or I'm not saying you have to quit your job and no. do what you do. Yeah. You know, that's, but that's what it's for is kind of that inspiration thing saying like there are the extremes, you know what I mean? And for yeah. me, it's like if anything, if somebody can 
reach out and you know ask me questions or wants to follow on the kind of these adventures it's simply to inspire and say hey you know what if this guy can do it i can do it maybe i don't have to do it to his his extreme or his level but i can do it maybe i can grab my dog my kids and we can go for a night and build that comfort and that that, you know overall self-reliance in the bush so yeah that's great yeah so i gotta ask what made you fully jump into into bushcraft was it like uh, cause you get out of the military, were you working like a nine to five or anything yeah. like that? And then you just decided one day, like, fuck it, I'm going to pretty much. Yeah. It was kind of a very unique. So I was living in Joshua tree at the time. Um, that was my last duty station was in 29 palms and we were living in Joshua tree cause I, I'm, I'm a big rock climber as well. And oh, Joshua nice. tree is like a, a mecca. It's a mecca yeah. yeah, it really is. So I was, I was there, I was loving climbing. I was working, working, uh, search and, uh, search and rescue. And then um, one day, I, I think I opened up my car and my garage at the time, and I looked at all of the stuff that I had, like packs and like sleeping bags. And I had like mountaineering gear from crampons to axe, just tons of stuff. And I was like, what am I doing with all of this stuff? Like, I just climbed Whitney. I mean, there were so many different things in there, and it kind of like was this huge burden. I looked at it as a huge burden. So I uh, pretty much collected it all up. I went and gave it out to a bunch of homeless guys. Um, said, mm. "Here's a you know thousand dollar sleeping bag. You'll stay warm and you know <laughs> en- enjoy." And I basically started all over. I said, "How did we as a as a as a people? How did we do this? How did we make ourselves thrive and survive?" And it really came down to stone tools. That was our our one very unique thing. Whether it was you know three million years ago using a Chulian styled hand axes or uh, simple choppers or just discoidal flakes to more of the ornate and like beautiful works of art we see kind of popping up. Um, so for me it was, how do, I, how do I take everything that I've learned over the years, these experiences and these opportunities and start from scratch? And it was saying, all right, you need to learn how to use stone tools and then you need to learn how to make stone tools. So in California, there's lots of obsidian. Um, I found a guy that made me made me at that time a couple um, hand blades and gave me some flakes and then I went out and used those till there was nothing left of them. Showed me how to resharpen them as far as pressure flaking and then I learned how to do all of the survival skills, all of the camping, hiking, crafting, bushcrafting skills with those tools and then once I was able to do it with those tools everything else just kind of fell into place and became a little bit easier to understand if I'm gonna you know shape a bow with uh, stone tools it's even easier to do it with a knife and an ax and a hatchet or even modern technology. So it was just kind of a reset. And uh, I took one archaeology class so I could kind of understand some specifics. And the archaeology teacher kind of set me on a, a few people to kind of connect with. And then from there, it's just been nonstop where, you know, um, I'll be the first one to admit, uh, if, you know, I'll, I'll be driving down the road and there's a nice piece of roadkill i'm like oh that's an opportunity pull off some of the high grab some sinew pull some fat antlers whatever's whatever's there is an opportunity and it was kind of that mindset of just everything i need can come from an animal it can come from the bush it can come from really anything in the natural world and i just never really kind of looked back it's just been a a non-stop yeah so it was really just having all that material stuff that you thought you needed didn't need it at all right we, 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 we don't really need it. Yeah. We, we, we want it. It gives us a certain level of comfort. So there's no reason why you have to be uncomfortable out in the bush. Right. But there's no reason why you can't figure out the natural way to obtain those comforts. And so. I think another rut that people get stuck in is, I mean, obviously that takes more time, right? Because you're creating your own tools. You're creating your own bow. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're using these primitive tools that take more effort yeah. to, to operate. Absolutely. Right? And uh, it's nearly not as fast so i'm sure that it teaches you patience yes right? yes and uh maybe a little bit be a little bit smarter about how you're actually gonna attack something or hunt something sure. or it's gonna make you a better hunter because you're not gonna have the range to shoot no some of these compound bows oh, there's guys yards. that take shots 80 <laughs> 90 yards you know it's I like know. it's crazy yeah but, like i just bagged this you know 300 point i'm like well you know 80 yards with the 90 pull on that you know i mean that's that's yeah. intense but you know with a lot of these primitive bows and even some of your recurve bows you got to get you know 18 to 22 is kind of a good range and if you can get closer i mean that's even better but i know for for me i call it just kind of honoring the hunt um like for example i have two sons right mm-hmm. i won't let them hunt until they can craft their own bow 
meeting state regs. Um, and once they can draw that bow back with an arrow and hit a target consistently, I feel like they are ready to hunt. That is their first yeah. journey, their first And I pathway. think that that goes across the board, whether you're hunting with a compound or not. It's just Absolutely. being ethical, right? That's a it. rifle. Yep. Like you... I, I don't know how to explain this, but you don't want the animal without sounding like a total bi- barbarian yeah. or murderer, but you want the animal to die quickly, Absolutely. painless, uh, if you're going to take their life. And it also helps with some of that adrenaline that rushes through the meat and stuff. Yes. It's going to taste better, right? Yeah, it's yeah. going to be... Quick kill. It's a quick kill, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And that's that's just kind of the, the overall approach is, you know... The, the, the honoring the hunt, the ethical hunt is, it's essential. And, you know, I've been hunting countless times and there's been opportunities where I've had the opportunity to just kind of push those limits a little bit. But I say the juice isn't worth the squeeze. I'm, I'm shooting, you know, an Osage bow or a Hackberry bow or some style of primitive bow. And I know I'm out of my, 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 my effective range, if you will. Maybe sure. it's at 19, 18 yards. As an instinctive shooter, you kind of know where that's at. But then the problem lies into, all right, I'm at 23. I've got to get closer. If I get closer, I'm going to walk through this bush. I could scare this thing. Well, at that point in time, I feel like for me, and this is, you know, for me, I'm not ready to take that animal. I haven't, I didn't do enough of the right things to put myself in the right spot to take that animal. I should have been three or four yards closer to actually take that shot. Sure. And that's just kind of my outlook when it comes to hunting. Like my favorite thing to hunt in Colorado is marmot. I love. Okay. I love. I love me some whistle pig. Yeah. Why? <laughs> because yeah, they're one. They're they taste delicious, and I, know I don't everyone, think I've ever eaten. One. Oh man, they're, they're my favorite. They're I really, see a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're great, but they're the perfect thoracic cavity size. Mm-hmm. And then marmot transitions into elk first season. So for me, it's like I can hunt marmot. It gives me dialed in a little bit. I got to get close. Sure. Marmot are very aware, and then it works nicely into the into the elk season. So, yeah, hunting is a uh, very important aspect of my my lifestyle but it's not something where uh, if i don't take an animal i feel as if i'm a failure i actually feel like all right you need to it's a learning lesson yeah, it's a learning lesson yeah. you need to work a little bit harder um it doesn't mean anything bad it's just kind of it's a process you know and it, when you hunt alone and you're not in a tribe you can rely on your tribe you know to supply those sort of things right so in that case, um, you know, I'm, I'm a lone hunter and, you know, I've walked up on other hunters with no kidding, carrying Starbucks coffee with all <laughs> sorts of stuff. And they're yeah. like, are you okay? Cause I've got very little clothing on. I'm smudged with smoke. I've slept in a pile of leaves the night before to truly authenticate my odor. Uh-huh. And, um, they kind of look like, am I a homeless guy? Like, What's yeah, the deal? No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm like, I'm kosher. Don't worry <laughs> about it. <laughs> you know, all is well, my friend, right. all is well. So. Yeah, it's, it's just part of it, though. Right. And that's what blows me away now. You have all this gear, like, uh, and it, don't get me wrong, it's badass. I don't yeah. knock anybody that has no, work in the No, by no means. By no but means. there's all these camo companies out there, I won't name any names, but they're talking, like, $1,000 for a, a jacket and pants, you know? That's and crazy. it's like, yeah. do you really need that? Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I my, don't know. My grandfather hunted deer wearing a red flannel shirt, smoking Marlboro <laughs> Reds. Yeah. And he never had an issue. So Elmer Fudd. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the the thing. I mean, I'm sure it, it, it builds into maybe your own psychological kind of like, all right, I'm, I'm, sure. I'm asking myself and odor this, odor that. But I say there's consistent natural odors in the environment. One of them is charred wood. We get natural fires. Wind blows through. You're going to smell that char. So I cover myself in that char. And then as well as any sort of things that might be pollinating or even, you know, any sort of the ground moisture. Yeah, I've even hunted with guys that won't sit by a campfire because they're like, no, I don't want to smell like smoke. And I'm like, that's "That's a natural. Total natural smell, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And there there could be, based on the environment you're hunting, the species, there's a lot of science that can go into it. But I don't overthink it and say if I'm I'm coming down to the point where I have to overthink it, I'm forgetting why I'm hunting. And for hunting, for me, it's that connection. It's a respect. It's an honor. It's it's a privilege to do that. One, it's a privilege to do it in, in Colorado. We're very fortunate to hunt. Yeah. Where people fly many, many miles to come here. And um, so I feel very fortunate that I have that opportunity. But it's also saying that um, this isn't something that I have to achieve that day is to bag a big bull or something like right. that. So. Yeah. I've never really been into the trophy hunting nope. aspect of it, so I, I nope. totally get where you're coming from. It's yeah. more to provide. I'm hunting for meat. Meat, yeah. That's straight up. Meat I and mean, resources. Yeah, meat yep. and resources, yeah, that's 100%. It. So. You won't see a photo with me holding up a kill or my foot on it. And not a lot of – I know there's been a lot of hunters 
that have done that mistakenly and uh-huh. have gotten some backlash. And um, I think it's a learning experience, and I'm not a trophy hunter. Anything I kill, that's between me and yeah. what they – and that's, that's my approach. That's totally my approach. There's a lot of great – Yeah, I don't knock that. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a lot of really good friends that yeah. trophy hunt and Absolutely. have mounts on their walls, and yeah. they're beautiful and, and stuff. It's just not my cup of tea. No, so. no, no. But, uh, but, yeah, I think a lot of that comes down, too, to – it's animal behavior, right? Mm-hmm. And studying animal behavior and being able to anticipate that yeah. is what has gotten me any success. For sure. So, yeah. But uh, behavior, tracking, following, understanding like environmental, you know, factor. I mean, it's that's what one of the reasons. Wind. Why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah as simple as that. Yeah. That's why I enjoy it is because there's there's quite a bit of actions that have to go into successfully completing a hunt um, with the end state of taking you know an animal, but any one of those things can throw you off in a heartbeat and it's game over. I mean, right. a crack of a twig, a change in the air, a change in the moisture in the air, picking up your scent and how it delivers into the nostrils. I mean, it's, it's right. That's crazy. It really is. So you have been in some situations and let's dive into your reality TV yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, lifestyle a little bit. Um, you were on uh, Alone? I was. was that, yeah. And that was on the History Channel History or Channel. something, right? Yeah. If, for anybody that hasn't watched it. Yeah. And uh, you've done multiple seasons there, right? Or- no. So um, Alone is basically they take 10 survivalists. They give them 10 survival items plus some additional um, recording equipment. Stick them out in the bush. And uh, the last one there wins, you know, whether it's $500,000. Um, I think this, this season, season seven, it's... Um, a million dollars, something to that capacity. And then, uh, yeah, whoever is left there, you're totally alone. There's nobody out there with you. There's no camera crews, zero. You are recording everything There's you're no saying. There's no craft services hanging Nothing, out. No, no crafty. P- no bagels, <laughs> no, donuts, and there's shit. There's no PAs running around <laughs> giving you what you need. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you're out there all by yourself, and uh, you have the option of, uh, they call it tapping, when you are you can't do it anymore you get hurt you get sick something has gone you know awry and you need help that is your only lifeline and for me i was on season six we were up in the canadian arctic and um i had a tap because i had uh dysentery and i oh really yeah i couldn't keep uh any fluids inside my body and i was getting to a critical point of you know succumbing to some sort of cardiac related event uh, brain swelling a lot of different things so um, as somebody who works in, you know, TV and film as a set medic, you know, taking my guiding background uh, out in the mountains and applying that to kind of remote filming, I mean, I was doing my own pulse and I was like, man, you're getting to a really, really bad state. And I, you know, I tried a lot of different things. I was looking for yara, which is a medicinal plant that really helps with, you know, digestive issues that you can definitely take that will kill a lot of these things. And I know this to be true because I've used it countless times. So I'm like, if I can find this, it's a game changer. And there was just none of that there. And then you start resourcing different things. But long story short, yeah, I had a, a bad bout of uh, dysentery, lost about 20 plus pounds, spent a good 10, 11 days in recovery on a feeding wow. plan. And um, yeah, it just, it really did a number on me. That was the third time I've had dysentery. And I had it once in the Middle East and I had it once in South Korea. And you know when you have it because it's coming out both ends. And the hardest thing is trying to rehydrate. And uh, And what causes that? Is it a parasite or something that you eat? Yeah, so different parasites. Um, Uh I picked it up in the orientation camp. So you spent a couple days out there getting familiar with the bush, but we were all kind of, you know, cramped quarters. And uh, we're eating berries and stuff like that. So I got it from some aspect of us just kind of being closely confined. And I felt some initial sim- symptoms in the camp, but it wasn't anything where I was like, oh, this is this is bad. I was thinking, like, oh, this is more nerves. You're excited. You're getting ready to go right. on, like, one of the <laughs> best TV shows. And, um, yeah, and I brought it out there, and then uh, it just got worse each each and day. But, you know, it's that's and that's the best part about it. So even though I had to tap on that show so many people, because it's airing on Netflix right now. My season is, oh, on, really? is on Netflix. Yeah. Cool, I'll have to go back and watch it. Yeah, and ironically, it's my mug up on the little oh, really? screen for yeah. Netflix. And I'm like, you guys don't want to put that up there. I mean, <laughs> people are going to be like, what is going on? Right. But um, but that's that's the most important thing is me relaying to people, saying is, is many of these things that I know and I'm familiar with, it can happen. Like, sure. you can be 
top of your game and one little parasite can creep up and like pull you out of it. Well, so, it's a good thing that you've had it before. Absolutely. And you knew what it was, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so you, are you a medical first responder then or like um, a wilderness first responder? Yeah. Or? So I've gone through Wolfer. Uh, I have my wilderness first aid, wilderness first responder. Nice. And then I have tons of military medical stuff. And one of the things that that has allowed me to do has work is essentially work on feature films and short films and a variety of films um, as a set medic, whether you are, it's, it usually ties into two things, set medic and safety coordinator. So, um, you know, you'll be monitoring weather systems, you know, communicating with local authorities on LZs, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, removing snakes or uh, driving roadways to make sure they're not washed out. And if somebody gets stung by a bee or, you have the necessary skills to, or snaps a leg to triage and then establish that medevac plan and then get them to safety. So um, that just kind of goes into that remote guiding, having that medical background and carrying the trauma kit and spine boards and IVs and all sorts That's of That's awesome because that keeps you out kind of where you want to be too, right? It does, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've worked some some great films, met some, uh, some great actors. The last film that I did um, last summer down in Terlingua, I was actually, they asked if I wanted to be in the movie, which was oh, nice. exciting. <laughs> so yeah, the director was like, we kind of have a small part. Um, and uh, w would you be interested? And I said, well, yeah, what do I got to do? And he's like, you just have to be yourself. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, you're just going to be this fun loving bush hippie river guide and you kind of have to <laughs> seduce these two women in a river you're going to cover them with mud do you happen to have a loincloth and i said as a matter of fact i travel <laughs> i travel with one so yeah <laughs> yeah there was i had to i had to text my mom like look you're gonna hear some things and see some things but i'm still your little boy okay right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so it's it's been a it's been a great thing but yeah having that background really helped out and alone um and then after that, a couple, well, I was maybe like a year later, I, I shot another TV show. This one was a spinoff called Alone the Beast, where I was stuck in a swamp for 30 days oh, with wow. no tools. It was myself and two other gentlemen, um, and they gave us zero tools, no knives, no axes, nothing, just the clothes on our back and one dead hog. So in Alone, you could bring 10 yeah, items, right? 10 items. Your fishing line, hooks, axe, saw, knife, ferro rod, pot, sleeping bag, a bow. You get a list that you can choose from. Okay. And I always call that the the solutions or the my problems are solved. So mm -hmm. on alone, yes, you are alone, and that's a whole other facet of, of dealing with that psychologically. But you have ten problems that are solved. Fire, it's ferro rod. Yeah. Boiling water, things to that extent. On this other show, there was no problems that were solved. And for me, they stuck me in a swamp. And as a guy that uh, I'm that, a mountain kid, dude. I don't <laughs> want anything to do with the fucking right. swamp. <laughs> I know that was I did so much research into this swamp because yeah. I was like there has to be some sort of stone there and there was zero stone really like, you give me a stone even a round river stone I can turn that into a tool because I can crack it and break it and fracture no it. rock at all huh? zero rock wow zero rock so so did you resort to like making wood because like some of the cypress wooden stuff is yeah. really strong and durable yeah, right that grows in swamps absolutely so yeah the cypress was definitely an option but one thing we used was cane and uh, oh, we, okay. we break cane, and cane has a razor sharp layer on the outside. Kind of like of a it. bamboo almost. Yep, or like something. a bamboo. So that was, you know, that gave us access to the animal. And then I was able to find some shells, um, clams, and mussels that raccoons are eating. And I could actually pressure flake the edges just a little bit to give myself more of a scoring edge. And um, from there, that was kind of essential. The, 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 the toolkit, if you will, was the shells, some of this cane. And then once I got access to the animal, I started pulling his bones out and was making hand choppers and atlatl dart points and little blades. The cutters on the hog. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I ran Gnarly. Down, yeah, I ran down a, a possum with a primitive club, clubbed that, and then opened it up with the cutters. They got so. some gnarly teeth on them that yeah. are pretty sharp. Yeah, so. they do. <laughs> so, yeah, that was um, – that was uh, another show, you know, so that was a good one. And then, you know, there's always kind of talks for other things and future things down the pipeline that uh, you'll hopefully, you know, will kind of come into yeah. to play. So, yeah, it's just kind of that was never really the idea for me was to, you know, get involved in TV or in film. It was just kind of, you know, promote a kind of way of life and like kind of, you know, foster that creativity and curiosity of the world. But. I have to say it's 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 given me a lot of really cool opportunities to be part of you know productions in various forms and uh, meet all sorts of amazing people and kind of you know establish a network. It's of, a cool niche. I've worked in film a little yeah. bit, but mostly rock and roll and <clears throat> on the production side of stuff. And yeah. most of the people that work in that industry, 
Some of the executives can be assholes. I'll say it out loud. I'm not afraid to. I'm not saying that. Don't forget it. I'm still a good guy. <laughs> but uh, yeah. a, some. I some. didn't say yeah, all. Yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, the crews, the yeah. grips, all those sort of people are just, they're like you and me. Yeah. You know, they can get along That's with it. about anybody. They yeah. can be in any sort of environment in the middle of the night and kind of make it work. Yeah. So Working those 12-hour days and then yeah. you that that off time and... I know it's just I, I enjoy that that world and it's relatively new. I've only done you know a couple films and some stuff, but um, I enjoy it. And I just I just got lined out to do another one out in Virginia for a horror flick. Um, it's oh, going to okay. be taken um, September and October, so I'm pretty pumped about nice. that one. I'll be doing a Rob that. Zombie. Uh, I don't know. Like that'd I don't, be awesome if it was. Yeah, yeah those films are cool. That'd be yeah. really cool. But I always I always enjoy it because like there's always opportunities to like meet more people. And then, like, through meeting people, you just kind of create these new, like, little pipelines of, like, yeah. not, I, I hate to use the word, like, resources, but, like, just good, genuine connections to people. And, like, some of the people I've met on uh, other films have been close personal friends now. We communicate routinely. And it's just. Yeah, I was talking about that family. on our last podcast. It's kind of like a, we had a firefighter on. Oh, right on. Uh, two episodes ago. And we were kind of just talking about camaraderie and yeah. like kind of that mentality that firefighters have kind of translates into the military sure. has the same sort of thing and film and yeah. roadies and that yeah, sort yeah. of thing kind of all have the same sort of thing. Yeah. But. Find your tribe. As yeah, I yeah, say. exactly. Yeah, there you tribe. go. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, uh, you're going into the bush, mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit. What's your standard kit? Like, I mean, are you going just walking out there with your loincloth and that's it? <laughs> or do you start with something? Yeah. So, um, Depending on, you know, the season, a lot of the different variables, usually I'm kind of rolling out there with just kind of a, a mix between a no-tech and a low-tech kind of, um, you know, kit, if you will. And I always go with my four Bs. That's a blade, a blanket, a bottle, and some aspect of a burn. And I say this because those are four of the hardest things to recreate out in the bush. So of those four Bs, let's say a blanket, I mean, that's woven material. That's, that's multiple aspects of processing so you sure. have to harvest an animal and let's say it's got to be some sort of sheep you yeah know? it's got to dry out a little exactly. bit and all that yeah Even it's got to cure yeah. yeah so that that requires a lot so maybe in that sort of idea i'll either bring a large animal hide and that will be my blanket or i'll bring um something i, I use called a patu which is from the hindu kush mountains out in afghanistan um and it's just a large shawl like blanket and i'll use that as you know my blanket and that's what i'll sleep in as far as a blade, I'll either bring steel or I'll bring stone. Mm -hmm. A bottle, I'll bring a, a metal water bottle or a clay pot. And then as far as a burn, um, either a ferro rod, but 99% of the time it's typically a hand drill. And uh, those four things are the four things that I bring and everything else I resource out there. Now, Can you explain a hand drill? Is, yeah. that, is yeah. that basically two sticks where yep. – uh, is it cinder or – Yeah, so uh, – a hand drill. Heard, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to let you talk about it. You're, <laughs> you're the good, expert. <laughs> no, you're good. A hand drill is a method of uh, friction fire. So the old saying, rubbing two sticks together, that is kind of one of those examples. And it's a, uh, a hearth board, which is your baseboard, the board on the bottom. And then there's a long spindle, which is essentially a long stick. And you connect those two through various means by cutting notches and adding uh, small little holes. And then the rotation of your hands with the spindle in between it creates friction down in the little hole and then what happens is you're essentially drilling out the mass of the wood and it's heating up so through friction we get heat and from that heat it starts to um, create this little sawdust that sawdust goes from a light brown to a darker brown to a black and once it turns to black it's starting to superheat and then all of that dust condenses together and it creates essentially the cherry of a cigarette creates a little coal uh -huh. and then I take it and just like this photo you see here I drop it into a tinder bundle like a bird's nest something very dry very open and then I breathe mm -hmm. oxygen into it and I okay. uh, you know give it life and that's the the breath of life and then the next thing you know that will burst into flame and uh, that's that's essentially and fire then you're adding that to tinder some dry tinder yep, or something some, you have some, readily yep, available some kindling and yeah. then your fuel woods and it's it's an entire process but i mean next year i'm traveling to the international bushcraft symposium um out in europe and one of the master classes i'll be teaching will be hand drill oh and cool yeah so i'm going to be there's people come in from all around the world and i have a couple one of them's on the um the long walk or you know walking for over great distances and and, and time with very minimal resources 
Uh, so I'll be doing a master class on that hand drill as well as primitive hunting. And so, wow. yeah, it's all, you know, those, those four things I bring, that is kind of my core. Now it could roll into a different situation. So let's say I'm going out with my two sons and we're going to go walk out in the McKinnis Canyons out like by, um, are now. they into this or they're like, dad, can we play PlayStation <laughs> or I don't yeah. even PlayStation is not even a thing anymore. Xbox, Xbox, like Xbox yeah. yeah. So yeah, with my boys, I have, uh, one rule. You have to just be passionate about whatever you're being passionate about. And I try to teach them, um, how to think, not necessarily what to think. So through me being their dad, they're definitely exposed to a lot of these things. They can, they can open up a deer with stone flakes. They've done some flint napping. Um, they've crafted their own bows, but I don't, I don't have a mandatory it's Thursday. Let's go make stone tools. I want them to find their own passions. If anything, just look at me as the example saying I can be a 40 year old grown caveman and (laughs) make a living playing with sticks and stones. You can do anything you want. So, um, we do a lot of things. We go paddling. We go rafting. They're great. They're great in the bush, bouldering and climbing. They're phenomenal skiers. Are these so, your kids here, or is no, this a class? Here? This this was a class that I was um, I was teaching. This was a homeschooling group, and uh, we went out in the bush and we did a kind of a single day walk through. And that photo right there, I'm discussing the uh, benefits of aspen bark to stop bleeding. So much. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's cool. It's really cool. So. Yeah. So you can stop bleeding with it? Yeah, so small little cuts, um, things like that. What you're doing is you're you're taking your blade and you're running up along the edge of the aspen tree and you'll get that fine white powder and you can apply it to a cut and it will stop the bleeding. It's not necessarily like a quick clot, but it's going to act as something that's going to um, nice. kind of coagulate it and get it all the stuff Learn something together. new every day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, And I like, you know, the aspen tree out here. Um, you know, just when I was discussing with those kids, was we were going over our also aspen conch which is a, you know, Phileas Tremaine is a scientific name, but it's, it's a polypore. And it's uh, one of those great little things here in Colorado that, uh, that the aspen tree has, and you can carry fire with it. So I'll build a fire in one cave, and I know i got to walk two days to this next one. I'll drop a piece of aspen conch in it, let it smolder, stick it between two sticks, and then I'll carry my fire in a smoldering piece of aspen conch to my next cave. So when I get there... So is the conch the black, like, kind of knots yeah, that so form around it, or the scars? It looks... So the aspen tree has, like, 14, 15, 16 different types of diseases that grow into it. And the aspen conch is one of the... Um, you know, the outsources are one of those diseases that grows from it. So it is actually, a, it looks like a horseshoe fungus. Um, it's a bulb. It's not the little black crusty pieces. Mm. It's an actual polypore that grows on the side. It will grow in various sizes. I've seen them as small as quarters as, you know, like a half a pie. Like if you think of like of a traditional apple pie, yeah. you see one of those sitting on the side. Um, but it's a great resource. You know, you can, um, it's rich in tannin, so you can tan hides with it. You can carry with it, uh, carry flame with it. Um, it's just a great little resource. So as I walk through, you know, this little landscape here, it's like, all right, let's talk about the Aspen tree. And it's 30 minutes of practical application and playing and learning. And, and whole new meaning to the word homeschool, yeah, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Which, you know, nowadays, um, it's the best way to do it, really. Yeah, yeah for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really great. So uh, when it comes to making primitive tools, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some rocks work better than others, for sure. I'm sure, right? Yeah. And uh, can you kind of walk us through the process? Like, uh, you probably start with a big rock that's round, like a river rock, break it into yeah. smaller chips, and then Absolutely. you start from there. How do you, how do you give it like that? Because a lot of those tools are so cool, man. They have like a serrated edge to them. Yeah. And, uh, if anybody knows anything about knife making or anything like that, a serrated blade is going to last a lot longer just because of the way it's shaped and yeah. and stuff like that for sharpness, right? Yeah, so it's 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 kind of funny when it comes to steel. Uh, I'm not a fan of serrations on it. I'm a fan of just a straight edge because if you look at a blade, the tip is my fine cutting. Maybe let's say it's a three inch blade, an inch and a half in is kind of that resourceful cutting, and right where it butts the handle, that's my mass removal. And I don't want any serrations there or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It just comes down to sharpening and knife maintenance. But when it comes to stone, um, typically a napper will start off with what they call just a large spall, and that's a big piece of stone. And from that stone, they'll reduce it down into smaller spalls and smaller pieces, if you will. And it's just a process of repetitive striking with the understanding of a couple different principles. One is called um, the Hertzkin cone. So if you ever shot a BB gun at a windshield, it creates a cone. 
So through impact creates this little 90 degree cone and you're going to get that same result when you're hitting a large river cobble against a piece of chert or flint. And from that, you can anticipate the angle and the strike where that break is going to take place. And through repetitive strikes, you can reduce a large, you know, if you imagine uh, something the size of a basketball, you can reduce it down to something where it's bifacial, two sides. And from those two sides, you can shape it into a spear point or some sort of... And that large. flint breaks off pretty much, I mean, sharp enough that it, you can cut yourself with, Absolutely. with it just the way it is, right? Yes. It's almost like a glass or... Yeah, so there's different types of stones. Um, I, in the most simplest form, we kind of have cherts, which is um, most of your, your ancient sea life, if you will. Same thing with, you know, flints. It's, it's compacted sea life that is kind of collected over time. And then you have um, obsidians, which is more of a volcanic glass. And you kind of have everything in between. There's all sorts of stones, if you will. But the idea thing, the ideal uh, stone is anything that breaks smoothly so it's not jagged. If you think of like um, granite, it's all granular and nodular, and you break it, it's all jagged. So it's kind of like to the feel, too. Like if granite almost feels like sandpaper, yeah. Where flint or obsidian, it almost feels like glass. Uh, glass. Exactly. Yeah. That's the idea is you want it to break like glass, have it break smoothly, and then more importantly, you can control the breaks. So through um, the creation of platforms and edge preparation on a stone biface, you can actually control where your flakes go through the strike, through the angle that you hold it, and you can reduce it down to, you know, one or two centimeters. You can get them really, really thin. And it's, you know, it's the, the preference of the nap or what they're creating and what tool they're making, but um, it is... A process now for most nappers that are starting out it is a process that could take a great deal of time and for those that you know progress in that sort of uh, lithic art you can craft uh, any number of arrowheads from a single flake in you know a couple minutes it's just through time and practice it's just like playing the guitar right sure you start off you do a few basic chords you're like yeah i can play the guitar and then you're like, well, I can't really do anything aside from How many from people make their first arrowhead and it's like this big? <laughs> usually, usually they're like that big. Oh, really? they're so, They break them in out of these little tiny pieces. Right. And, you know, I, I saved my first arrowhead I made a couple of years, you know, just – and it's – pointy that's all it is it was like all right this looks like an arrowhead i'm calling it quits and yeah. that was good <laughs> and now it's it's come down to where you know a lot of the knives that i make um uh, hunting points whether it's axes or i mean i've i've made large um axe heads out of big pieces of chert that you can fell trees with um that's really? that's the tool kits that i teach so when i teach a, a stone tool technology course the very first thing we do is we take a bunch of the stone tools i've already made and then we go out and we use them and what that does is it shapes your understanding, your learning on how to actually make them and then what you're making them for. So um, that makes sense. Yeah, I was teaching a stones tool class not too long ago. We were pulling off some really nice long flakes. And then we took those flakes and then we went and used them as if they were draw knives for making a bow. And you could draw just the same as you would for a bow, just these nice really? big pieces of, of wood off. And that was a tool. And I always tell people, it's you're not there to create these beautiful points. You're there to make tools. That's why you're here. We're here to learn these things so we can essentially possibly maybe have to survive with this it. This is an art class. This is <laughs> a really, <laughs> survival really is. class. It really is. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's also the other aspect is saying this, the first knife, and I have a, an article coming out pretty soon all about the first knives, and it's just a simple stone flake. And I, I think you had a photo of me holding a flake, but if you can pull one flake off of a piece of chert or obsidian, that one flake right there, you can process out all sorts of game. You can cut notches and fireboards. You can do everything and anything with that one little blade. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's just, it comes down to time and practice. I mean, um, I think it was May time frame. I was uh, linking up with CU Boulder and we, some of the archaeologists and anthropologists there, we did a bison um, butcher and atlatl hunt. And long story short, we were we butchered it out with stone tools and a lot of the stone tools that i had used and brought were just the easy peasy you know what i mean it was kind of one of those things i had some crescent knives and some little hand blades and you take a you know several hundred pound bison and you open that thing up with stone blades there's not a lot of people in the u.s that have done that so it not took, at all man yeah it took me That's... eight hours but it, we got it done that was pulling the hide off and then you know it was on its belly so i took all the quarters off and then we you know just really got into it but yeah that's that so was cool 
they work. Did or, you guys hunt it primitively too? Or? Yeah, so that was the original plan, and then you know different people get involved in this yeah. and the other. But um, so it was a, it was an older cow. They dispatched it uh, very ethically, and then we positioned it where the idea behind the study was to study the impacts of stone um, at lateral points on bison. So I went there to throw. Um, I think we threw over maybe 175, close to 200 at lateral darts at this bison, recording the impacts. And the idea was for them to uh, study the penetration of these stone points and uh, kind of see how that's going to you know, influence or kind of educate us on early hunter gatherers and how they hunted megafauna. Sure. And uh, so, yeah, that that carcass right now should be going up in the CU Boulder uh, Museum with all of the stone points and impacts in it. Really? Um, kind of, yeah, showing folks. Like, I would love to go see that. Yeah, it's it's going to be there. Um, I know th- we dropped it off at the Beetle Arium where they the beetles eat all their last remaining flesh off of it. But, uh, yeah, it was um, it was quite an experience. And I got to walk home with a nice big bison heart. And I'm a big yeah. organs guy. I love organ meat. So I had the heart and the liver, some nice loins and straps and some big pieces of sinew. That's on my bucket list is a bison hunt. And I think yeah. it's just that reconnection with. Yeah. native culture and i have a mo- minuscule amount but yeah. but still it's just so intriguing that sure. culture is in- incredible for sure um, but yeah so you you spend a lot of time hunting and stalking obviously because you're in the bush and yeah. that's how you're surviving you're not going you're not pushing your shopping cart down the grocery <laughs> aisles and oh that looks good yeah, right yeah. so so uh I mean, obviously, there's hunting seasons, and Game and Fish regulates mm-hmm. a lot of that now. So it's not like yeah, it was the way that you're living. It's not that way now, right? Exactly. So you can only take certain animals. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, that probably turns into like small game and stuff. Are you building traps? Are you yeah? So how, how does that work? So primitive trapping is illegal pretty much everywhere you go. Um, mm-hmm. So when it comes to trapping, I I stick to all state regs and rules and regulations. I'm a huge advocate of like. As much as I enjoy this, there's still practicality of what's going on as far as game management, population management, and I have to stick to that. Um, so when it's small game season, I'm usually out there with a bow. That's my number one take, and that's how I have to go about taking them. What I teach and what I show people is methods to take game in lieu of having a bow or some sort of uh, advantage, if you will. So that's where it comes into that survival aspect. And I always say in the event of, you know, let's say a pandemic or anything like this, and sure. you, you've got to, this might be a solution. Again, I preface it's X, Y, and Z, it's illegal. Um, but when it comes to, you know, sticking to rules and regulations as far as the seasons, um, fish is always a huge option. It's that's a great option. Yeah, it's a great option, whether you're hand lining, you're regular fishing, or you're just hand fishing, where you're just scooping them out of the water with your hand. Um, foraging is another great thing. Scavenging is another thing. Um, I've taken uh, back straps for mountain lions. That's a whole other story within itself. But yeah, there's there's different options. So wait a minute, what you've taken a lion's kill and or you've actually taken back straps from the lion? Uh, the kill from the lion, and you know, really, yeah. Without going, okay. On. Wait a minute, I gotta hear this story. <laughs> yeah. What? Um, so I was out with uh, two SF guys where I was teaching a class and they were, it was like a four day. I was going to ask you that if, you know, being down where you were yep. and originated, that's a huge SF base for yeah. the mountain division, right? Absolutely. One yeah. of my buddies actually went SFG. down there and uh, was a special forces guy and stuff. And we, we had him on the podcast too, yeah, right but uh, great guy. Shout yeah. out to Luke Burrier, man. Yeah, He's an awesome right guy. But, uh, but yeah, I was wondering if you ever taught those guys. Do. Yep. Okay, I'll, I'll, we'll get into that. I'm diving off. I'm <laughs> no, like no, a no, real good. excited kid here, but yeah. I got to hear this mountain lion but, story. Yeah, so the, the idea for this class was um, I was teaching them a variety of skills uh, as far as just kind of food acquisition, foraging, primitive trapping, um, just tracking and following because there's kind of a big difference there. But um, we set up So some, did they come to you because of, um, was it Sear School or it's like... Now like this, evasion type stuff? No, or? this was something um, not related to any sort of DOD. Oh, okay. This I'm was, sorry. Th- yeah. yeah, this was my own program. They sought me out and said, you know, we want to learn more. We've got an XYZ training, but we want to bring it to that next level. So can we come for a walk with you out in the bush? And I said, got yeah, it. absolutely. Okay. Um, so we kind of set up some traps, and we were kind of doing some things. And it was early in the morning, and I was like, well, let's go walk this line. Let's do some tracking. Let's see, because we set some um, – track traps where you just kind of dust trails and you leave some opportunities for new things to walk through. And as we were going through, 
we were coming gently coming over this little piece of micro terrain and we all caught this smell that we were all very familiar with and it was that smell of blood in the air and we all kind of looked at each other like all right yeah. something's dead on the other side of this and we peeked up over the hill and there was a mule deer that had just been taken and the cat this big tom i'm assuming it was i like to say it's a big tom it's probably juvenile that's why i'm still alive but anyway um <laughs> you whatever know, it was a 190 pound mountain lion exactly, everybody <laughs> exactly um so you could see where it had, you know, wrapped its mouth around its neck. You could see the claw marks and all sorts of, you know, uh, trauma to this mule deer. And right when it was starting to nibble and pull out that, that kind of. So it's it super was fresh then, not super, like buried or anything? No, it wow. was like, it was opened up where we could smell that first burst of like, wow, this is something dead. So by our noise and movement, we think we scared it off. Uh -huh. So as, you know, it, we didn't. Couldn't see it wherever it was, but there's this all these they're rocky. They're so stealth. Oh, man. they're so stealth. And I knew it was there. And like they were like, like holy cow, this is crazy. Absolutely. Like, what should we do? And I was like, well, this cat's still in the area. I have no doubt that he's here. He's watching us. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna slowly kind of exfil out of here in the most tactical way, and uh, we'll head back to camp. We'll let him take his thing, and he'll go about his day. So we kind of take this this carcass and kind of drag it off the trail a little bit. And then we start walking back up. We go up over that hill and we start walking back down. And I was like, hey, I'm going to do something. I don't recommend doing this, but let's let's have some fresh food, right? And they were like, <laughs> what, are you going to this? And I, and I, like, I was kind of like dancing around. I didn't want to like openly admit I was going to go um, see what I could cut off of this bad boy. But uh, that's what I was going to go do. So I said, I will meet you guys at the camp if you don't. You, know, <laughs> you guys don't hear from me. So what do you got on you at this point? Are you stone tools? Yeah, no. This time I, I think I like a little. I think I like a little tiny knife. Swiss Army yeah. knife. <laughs> so they were like, "All right, you know, we exchanged that general military banter as far as calling each other this, that, and the other." They went back to camp, and then when I crested that hill again, I could see where that mule deer had been drugged back down farther from that trail. So as we were bullshitting on the other side. It had come over there and grabbed the hold of it and started pulling it towards the rocks. Wow. So, you know, the pucker factor goes in, and I was like, all right, you got you just did a couple dumb things. One, you just told a couple SF guys you're going to go cut the loins out or the back strap <laughs> so out. You got to go and do it. <laughs> and sure as anything. Um, yeah, as soon as I hit the top of the hill and I saw that I was, you know, that mule deer was in sight, I just kind of went into this, like, you know, eyes aware, everything's, like, going on mode, and I just slowly walked towards this deer, and there's this – Rocky ledges, kind of like um, as you go down into like Canyon City, you got all those like just rocks, right? And they're yeah. all stacked up and bouldered Big boulders, up. Yeah, yeah. I knew it was sitting that in there. That is lion country. Oh, pure man. lion yeah. country. <laughs> so I'm watching these rocks, looking for any movement, and I just walk up to this thing and just pull out my knife and jam it right down the back, slice it open, and just kind of start, you know, working my fingers along that spine, and I pull out this nice little little piece of back strap. And just walk backwards, kind of give a bow, like, thank you for letting me, you know, eat this and not eating me. And then as soon as I crested that hill, I just took off like a rabbit. Dude, man. I was you, running. You <laughs> have some running. cojones. I don't oh, think I man. would go back and do that. It was Maybe now that you've told me that you've survived it. <laughs> it was the dumbest. Well, that's right. I like to think it was like this, like, 280-pound tom, just this beast yeah. of the woods. But it was probably some juvenile that got lucky. And I don't know, though, but to take down a deer, is it a full doe or? Yeah, a it was a doe. Okay. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was I mean, deer are no. Mule deer are not small. No, I they're mean, not. They're yeah. not. And they've got that that advantage around that neck with all that fur. There's so much yeah. gap in there. But, you know, a big cat was it the definitely the dumbest thing I've ever done. Yeah. And like, <laughs> cool story, bro. <laughs> yeah. I, wrote, I actually wrote about it in a book. And then, like, people would be like, that's the, I get more feedback. Like, that's the dumbest thing. You shouldn't do that. I'm like, I know yeah. I shouldn't have done that, but I was hungry. And so, hey, backstraps. If, that's for people that don't know or don't eat wild game, that is choice. Choice meat. Choice meat. Yeah, yeah really 100%. Yeah. 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 Inside loin backstrap, that's that's go to. So, yeah, that's that kind of comes down to the scavenging bit if I don't have the food resources. But, uh, you know, whatever presents itself and is it's an option. And it's kind of like taking advantage of what's in your environment. Like, that's don't it. let – I mean, if you're in a survival mode, you kind of want to take 
what you come across, yep. right? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a there's a philosophy I live by. When I see it, I take it. So I could be walking from eight thousand feet to twelve thousand feet. What exists at eight thousand does not exist at twelve. Oh yeah. So 100%. resource wise, right? So like yeah. berries, greens, you name it. I'm gonna get it in the lower elevations and then resource it and use it up at those upper elevations while I'm looking for something else. That brings up my next question. Yeah. How much of your diet is like plant-based, like mushrooms yeah. and uh, fungi and just yeah. stuff? All that. I mean, there's a ton of stuff you can eat out there. I don't know sure. what you could, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to come learn from you. Yeah, so. no worries. Um, <laughs> you know, so when it comes to the plant-based, that's really my seasonal sort of stuff. Once the, the first spring hits in the lo- lower elevations and things start blooming and blossoming, I like to go to a lot of those plant-based because, again, there's no game in season aside from right. Eurasian ringneck dove, which you can take year-round, coyotes, rattlesnakes, snapping turtles, things like that. But that's all environmentally based. And a lot of those coyotes and stuff have parasites yeah. and just weird, yeah. you can not get, good stuff. No, you can get all sorts of funkiness to them. And I've, I've experimented eating some coyotes. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, I've taken a few here and there. It's, but ironically, some of the ones that are way up in the mountains around that, like, above 10,000, 11,000 feet are way healthier. I mean, I know why. There's, they're not eating trash. They're right. eating marmot and pika and grouse and all sorts of ptarmigan. So, yeah, the ones that live in the lower elevations or dumpster dive that's all they are that's all they are um but yeah so when it comes to the kind of the plant-based stuff seasonally um as we move into like mushroom season like right now we haven't had a lot of water so yeah it's been a rough year for mushrooms yeah Yeah. it's been like no go i know like in some of the more like stream beds and where there's just more ground saturation mushrooms will pop up but i've even noticed some of the little streams around here are like completely dry bone dry it's crazy Yeah. yeah Yeah, so plants, mushrooms, berries, um, acorns, you you name it. If it's there and it's edible and it can be processed pretty simply as far as just boiling it out or eating raw, it's going in the gut. And then when it turns to any sort of, you know, wild game, anything like that, if it's in season and I can take it ethically within the state regs, it's, it's going on the menu. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah, why not? Yeah. So what other plants can you eat besides, like, mushrooms and uh, – I know you can eat like dandelion leaves, yeah. uh, stuff like that, and uh, yeah. obviously there's raspberries and sure, you know, so there's some berries out there that you can eat. Yeah, so the dandelion's great. I mean, uh-huh. everything on the dandelion is edible, and you can eat it raw, so it requires no boiling, nothing like that. You don't have to roast it. It was crazy. I used to get really bad indigestion. I, I figured out it was from eating. Actually, I always thought it was like. Uh, like red sauce or something, because I always get it after I eat like a tomato sauce or okay. something with pasta or yeah. pizza. But I found out it was the actual grain. Yeah. And I went to this holistic doctor, and they were like, "Go get some dandelion greens from Whole Foods. There you go. Eat those, and it it literally just wipes any awesome. indigestion you have yeah. completely out. It's a cure all. So, well, that's it's well, yeah. dandelion's great. I mean, that's <clears throat> that's the real green. You know what I mean? Those yeah. dandelion leaves. People in Boulder pay forty dollars for a salad because it's exactly. got dand- <laughs> dandelion greens. You know, <laughs> you can come to my backyard. Exactly. I got a shitload of exactly. Them, yeah. So <laughs> when it comes to that, you know, um, that's a go-to. I love roasted dandelion root because it smells like pumpkin pie and it tastes like pumpkin pie. Really? That's my own personal opinion. Okay. But uh, yeah, so the bush out here is full of full of plants. You know. Um, a couple of the ones. Have you we, ever eaten uh, thistle, like uh, the yeah, purple yeah. bulbed plants? Yeah. So that's there's creeping thistle and those bull thistle. So okay. the great thing about thistle is um, it's a hundred percent edible. Raw. Really? Yeah. So what you have to do is you got to pull those leaves off. Yeah, because it's got thorns or exactly. Yeah. So you pull those thorns off. So you face the leaf away from you. You strip it both of those sides off, and you get that real thick um, stem, if you will. It's kind of like a white. Yeah, it's almost white. like a rhubarb or something. Somewhat, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very white, but it tastes like celery. It's really? got a little bit of a peppery kick to it. But the one thing that's really great about thistle is it grows everywhere. Yeah, and it will—it's an aspect of uh, hydration too because it's—it's it's packed with moisture. So the thistle stems is really good, as well as the thistle root. It kind of grows in a very kind of like. Uh, kind of like a carrot-like shape. It grows down deep, and once you pull it out, you get a nice tuber, and you can roast that over there, and it's just like eating a potato or a carrot. Um, really? Burdock is another one of those plants that's out here. We have common burdock. There's all different sorts of, of burdock in Colorado, and uh, the burdock leaves are great, but it grows an actual, like, thick root, as thick as this water bottle. Really? That you can cut up, boil out, and have a nice little meal. Um, so burdocks and thistles, sorrel. Um, we have all sorts of sorrels out here. And sorrel is a lot of your clovers. Well, you have, like, 
different types of clovers, but your actual sorrel is, um, it's a sour. That's kind of how you know you're eating a sorrel. So you have like wood sorrel, sheep sorrel. I mean, there's over 400 different types of sorrels wow. and it grows everywhere. And what I like to do is catch trout and then pack it full of sorrel. And then you get a nice little citrusy, oh, lemony yeah, flavor on some I trout. always do uh, lemon or lime is my jam actually. Yeah. Like, uh, Mexican beer and <laughs> is the way to go, you know, yeah. pour a little beer in there. And That's right. Some lime juice in it. Man, it's good. But yeah. uh, especially brook trout or something like yeah, that. Yeah, some brookies. Yeah. I've been into these cut bows. Have you? Oh, yeah. Those man. are delicious. Those are awesome. Oh any any native trout yeah. is, is what I like. It's a 10,000 yeah. foot rule. If it's above 10 grand, yeah. uh, it's going in the belly. <laughs> That's my, yeah. my trout. And you're out. hungry by the time you get there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, so, uh, so tons of plants, tons of plants out in Colorado. There's so yeah, being out there, I mean, it's really, it's just the knowledge of knowing what you can eat and what can make you sick, right? Because yeah. there's some stuff that can make you sick too. You just don't want to go, yeah, traipsing around the woods eating all kinds of different plants yeah. that look good, right? Well, that's that's kind of the downside. So I mean, technically everything's edible once. That's kind of the ongoing joke. Um, <laughs> but you know, the reality is, it comes down to. Um, Understanding, and I always preach this as your straight eight. You should know what your straight eight is, and your straight eight is three plants that are um, medicinal that will help you with ailments, sicknesses, diarrhea, things to that extent. Three plants that are edible as an actual food source, and then two plants that are good for tools or resources like glues, mm -hmm. adhesives, cordage, things like that. And what you want to do is you want to study those eight plants, your straight eight, through all four seasons. Because then you'll truly understand the full capabilities as well as the limitations of those plants on a seasonal basis. So, like out here, we have something called dogbane. Dogbane's a great plant. And it's a phenomenal cordage. Um, we have so cordage. You're talking about rope, like a rope, rope or like strings. a yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, it requires a little bit of like secondary tooling where you have to reverse wrap it and make it into a nice uh, piece of string or cordage. Are you it, talking about something you can repel with, or is this something no. to like fasten stone um, to handle or yeah, something like that? Yeah, you can that? definitely fasten some. Um, some stone to you know a spear you can definitely um, make some some ties with it uh, you can hang up game with it oh wow um, and that's just a single piece but you can actually make rope out of dog bane. it's that's a huge awesome. yeah the Paiute culture that was a big culture that existed all through Utah and even out here yeah um, huge huge dog bane users but uh, willow so we have seep willow we have coyote willow we have different types of willows that grow through some of the stream beds but that itself is a tooling plant. So willow is great for atlatl darts. It's great for uh, friction fires as making well. Making s'mores. Making s'mores. You got to have your <laughs> s'more sticks, right? And you could even, uh, it has um, psilocybin in it, which is uh, an aspirin. So you can yeah. do a willow bark aspirin. So as I have clients that, you know, got light headaches, I'll whip up some real quick, uh, you know, willow bark tea and it kind of just gives them a little one over and they feel a little bit better. So yeah, understanding the plants out here is is, is uh, extremely important because, you know, again, 8,000 feet, 9,000 feet, it's way different at the top of a 14 or once you start hitting them yeah, with screen Yeah, so fields. as you're going to that 10,000 feet, you had mentioned earlier, you're kind of grabbing that stuff yeah. as you go, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, I've never really thought about that. It yeah, makes so a lot of sense because you get up there, there's not a whole no, lot of anything. There's nothing. There's no know? cover. There's no nothing. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> it's rock shelters and little, you yeah. know little overhangs but like one plant that we have out here is a narrow leaf yucca and that plant is cordage it's basket making it's you can make sandals with it as well as the stalk is great for hand drill and then when it flowers you can eat all of you've you've seen them those, yeah yeah you can eat all those flowers raw they're absolutely delicious wow you can add those to other salads the root is great for a soap you can cut it up in little pieces put some water to it and create a little lather clean yourself um yeah so i mean this state is great on resources, but this is a harder place to to teach survival as well as practice survival because it's not like the eastern woodland where right. you might go up. Gets a bit more extreme. Yeah, yeah, you're fighting a whole different aspect when it comes to weather. So, like, when people come to Colorado. Um, and altitude, not well, to mention. Yeah. yeah, the altitude's huge. The weather, the altitude, our, our animals here, you know, moose. I don't know. There's tons of moose out in the collegiates and the front range. I've yeah. seen more moose along the front range than I have in some of these places. It's crazy, man. Yeah. yeah. So but the population's really growing here. It is. I think it's. I always get excited when I see some moose uh, running around, and I've had some close calls 
on the front side. God, this is with bulls or? Well, it was one bull chasing two cows, oh, so I could hear. They're f- gnarly, man. They you are want gnarly. to keep your distance. Ooh, yeah. Well, I heard them coming through the trees. My head, you know, was like, "What is that?" And as I stood up, both of those cows turned, kind of. And they were in the distance, but they started running towards me. And then that bull was chasing those two, and I was like, "There's three moose coming right at me." I like threw everything down that I had, <laughs> found the tightest clump of aspen trees, and like laid yeah. down. And like an idiot, I was like, I need to go get a closer look. And then, yeah, <laughs> and then, yeah it was just. Yeah, it's crazy. The couple times that I've spooked them or seen them growing up here, we didn't have moose. Yeah. Right. They repopulated yeah. them here and they've really thrived. And that, I guess uh, from what I've learned from some biologists and stuff, that this is like the perfect habitat for them. Yeah, like, it's a great one. It's a great habitat. So that's why they've done so well here. But as a kid, they were never in there. Mm. So, and a lot of times they're black. Yeah. So I just think. There's a bear, bear. you know, and yeah. I'm on full alert, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's not very often you run into a bear or something or that I do unless you're really in the thick of, like, I like to fly fish and bushwhack it and, yeah. and stuff like that, and that's where I've run into them. But other than that, they're pretty elusive. Yeah, for but, sure. But, yeah, uh, so navigation. Yeah. What are you doing for that? Like, how are you – are you doing it from a map or are you just yeah. land marks or – Yeah, so – One of my favorite things to teach is navigation, and I've been doing that for probably longer than anything. Like, as a young kid, It's key to uh, being outdoors. It's like... No matter what you're doing. Yeah, it really is. You get turned around so easy. It's super easy, and I think that's one of the things that you really need to teach kids first is navigation, like core navigation skills, cardinal direction finding, where did I park, how do I get there, that sort of thing. Um, But for me, navigation is never one of, I carry a map or a compass. If I'm going somewhere, I do something called sign tracking. And sign tracking is kind of a method that I've developed where as I'm walking from one location, I'll identify macro and micro signs, mountain peaks, uh, stream crossings, hard bends in rivers, and then I will join them with a macro and micro sign. So I know my macro will bring me to my micro, right? So Mm -hmm. as I'm walking, I kind of find this little cluster and I'll give it a general name. And I know I can see that mountain from the distance because it has some unique features or I'll, I'll, I'll find it. So I'll walk to that macro feature and then I'll walk beyond that macro feature because you got to remember if I'm coming back, I'm going to be looking at it from the opposite direction. So I'll set up a series of sign tracks if I'm going to a place where I'm going out and back. Um, and that just gets me back to wherever I started. If I'm doing a, like a walkthrough or if I'm going to do a you know start here, end here, I've got a couple buddies that will drop me off in certain part portions of the state, and then I'll just walk home. Mm. And then I just I just follow east. Right. <laughs> and then wherever I go. And then whether it's the front side, you can usually – you'll start to see some of the – You, you know, can tell which lights. side of the mountain you're on yeah. by growth and that sort of yeah. thing. And yeah, and you, you, you kind of figure it out. You know, like I've come across all sorts of very unique things out in the bush, but – the easiest things, we have the mountains out here. And once you know a couple core mountains and how they respond geographically, um, and then 70 cuts the state in half. So if you know you're south of 70, you're like, all right, I'm, I'm, I know where I'm at. But the one of the areas I've been getting into a lot more is out in the McInnes, the, the, our whole Dominguez Escalante area on the western half of the state because it's nothing but canyons and rivers and streams. And is that in, in the uh, Santa Ana Cristo range? or No, so Grand Junction. You know where the border is, right? You know, Grand Junction into Utah. Yeah. So all of those canyons going all the way down south to the Four Corners. It's oh wow. Yeah, like that, I don't want to say that over. There's that. a ton of native culture that oh, lived tons. in those too, right? Like yeah. that's where Mesa Verde is yep. down in down in like Durango. In yep. Yeah. Our Colorado has one of the, I believe, and this isn't me. Quoting, is that you there? In that? Yeah, that's area? me. That's down that's in awesome. Dominguez Escalante. Yeah, my boys and I were out hiking and. We found this waterfall, and I was like, well, let's trip down and go swimming, you know? And they were like, let's do it. So (laughs) that was kind of uh, that day. But, yeah, we were just just out and about doing our thing, and we just kind of go and explore. But, yeah, that entire half of our state is all canyons and deserty, and it's some of the most archaeological sites, I think, I think we have some of the most archaeological sites in North America, like oh, Colorado yeah. along like, that border. And it varies from all kinds of different yeah. tribes, and yeah. it's really cool, man. Yeah, we have the Lindenmere site, which is north of us right along the border, and then they did that big uh, stone tool cache that was found in Boulder a couple years yeah. ago, and that had, like, that's actually up in the um, the museum at the university, and they had, like, 
ancient camel residue along. I mean, just some really? gnarly stuff all up and down wow. here. And I'll, I'll be out and I'll find um, little rock shelters, uh, some different glyphs that are on the, and you'll find mono matates, your grinding stones oh, you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. You'll find all sorts of stuff. And my approach is typically if I find those, I, I, I leave it like, you find bowls or baskets. Yep. Uh, I try to leave it, and the idea is I don't really share where it is because for the longest time people would go and take And it's different from picking up like a little arrowhead you find in a riverbed compared to, you know, you're going to an ancient mill site or grain site and there's, sure. you know, bowls and stuff. Well, there's but, so many burial grounds that have been robbed. Yeah. And just, it's, uh, it's just kind of disheartening think, a little bit. You yeah, know? I think if people come across that, what they should do is they should definitely photograph it um, and then bring it to the, the attention of any of the universities that are in around the state saying, hey, I just came across this. My goal is to safeguard it and contribute it. And this is where it's at. So I'm putting it in your hands right now. So I know if it's taken from this point on, it's you guys. It's you you know? guys yeah. So, But, yeah, I think that's probably the best um, thing to do because that was out in some canyons. That was just a little rock overhang. And you can kind of see in that photo I have my patu with just some items wrapped up in it and – that's what I was rocking for a couple of days. That's you, awesome. Yeah, you find a spring, you drink from a spring and forage around. And sometimes you just don't eat. You know, that's the other thing of people don't know it. And it's not for everybody, but no, it's not. <laughs> in my opinion, it's the good life, man. That's yeah. that's awesome. It's yeah. it's great to it just blows me away that somebody can in this day and age dial it back that far. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think it's I think it's awesome. I think I appreciate it. As a as a culture, I wish we could do a little bit more of that because I think it would settle some of this unrest that we have you yeah. know what i mean because i think connecting back with nature what it does for me anyways is it it doesn't make me think about like racism it, it yeah. just it kind of wipes that clean right it does. and especially when you're trying to survive or look for food and yeah it's just kind of yeah yeah it, i think when you reconnect and you rewild with nature you kind of realign yourself to kind of an innate you know, being, if you will. And it gives you an opportunity to just really embrace everything that's around you. And it's understanding that, you know, this stream will dry up, but one day it will be full of water. And maybe you want to be there when it is full of water because then you can have a drink. And it's that simple thought. You're like, man, I'm pretty thankful for that, you know, and I hope one day this stream will be full of water and I can continue to drink from it. And it's that simple little thing or like that stream is going to give me life. It's going to give me opportunity. It's going to give me another day. And then that turns into the biggest value, not necessarily what gun I have, what knife I have, what shoes, car, house, cell phone, so on and so forth. Right. It's the simple things. Like I know where there's mushroom patches out here and I love going to them because they've yielded so much to me over the years. And it's, less, it's exciting to say, all right, I know I'm going to go get some great mushrooms. I'm not, not going to take them all. I'm going to leave them and I'm going to hit some spores on the right. way out. And I'm going to have a couple great meals from that. I'm very appreciative of that. I'm going to walk 10 miles to get to it, but I'll do it. You know, that's such a great <laughs> outlook, man. And um, the whole reason for me starting this podcast was to raise some awareness about the influx of people coming here yeah. and to help educate people like, I was lucky enough growing up and you being a Colorado native and no, not a native. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, th I thought you no were worries. Like, well, close enough. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I've been here enough. a long time. Yeah. But, since uh, I was but anyways, growing up here and you've seen the change and you've seen the influx in people and you spend a lot of time outdoors. I just wanted to help educate people that maybe just take it for granted yeah. and, and, uh, maybe take those resources or maybe they go fish a stream when it's too hot or yeah. they're fishing to spawning fish or, yeah. you know, it, there's a ton of different things that we can do that can really impact our environment. Right. Yeah. And there's a ton of things that we can do to help it. Yeah. So, uh, I just want to help educate people on, on that side of it. You spending as much time as you do outdoors and, um, seeing the influx and the growth here, what are some things that you've noticed that have changed that we could do better as humans yeah. to help protect that and preserve that? So like you just said, you go to the same mushroom patch every year. You don't get greedy. You don't no. take them all because if you take them all, Gosh, they're, gone. they're gone forever, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It comes down to like, for me, an appreciation. And I think what maybe some people that um, are going to be listening and they can really relate to this is that we've become lazy. We want the simple solutions. And, you know, it breaks my heart when I'll be walking out in the bush and maybe I'll come to an area and I'll see 
just trash thrown yeah. out and dropped. And it's like, I know everyone now today lives in a house and everyone has the ability to throw out their trash. Just bring it with you. Cause I'll pick it up and I'll bring it with me. And I've done that many a times I've walked out of the bush with my four B's, a blade, a blanket, a bottle and a burn and a bag of trash. Um, right. So let's stop being lazy and let's kind of take care of our areas first, take care of these natural places. And I think first. that goes a step further too. Like, uh, you know, if you see it out there, it, may, it might not be yours, yeah, bring it. but pick it up, pick it up. Yeah. It's the easiest thing. I always tell my kids, if we're not coming back with trash, that's awesome because then we know people aren't throwing it out there. But if we are coming back with trash, it's even more awesome because now we're taking care of it. So right. it's one of those dynamics. But yeah, we got to we got to we got to clean up. You know, leave it nicer than you than you found it. And then I think there's there needs to be an understanding when we are out and we're experiencing these natural places. People are going there to experience for what it is. Like if you're carrying a, a loud radio out of the bush, you're missing the point. Right. Those it, JBL speakers, yeah. they're like on, hanging off your backpack. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear it. And it's like, you know, go out there and just know that there's probably other people around. So you should respect why they're there. It's that kind of mutual respect of, you know, when, when we're all there, we should all be in our simplest form. No, yeah. no judgment, no biases, taking care of the environment. Because right then and there, the natural environment is giving you something and somebody else could be taken away through their own actions, screaming and yelling or playing their music, whatever. But like, let's just remember why we go to these places and try to build upon that. So it's maybe connection through family. Maybe it's connection through, you know, kind of finding your own inner peace, um, reflection into maybe your day or your life. People go to the natural world because there's a natural draw there. It's innate in all of us. Yeah. You know, we all come from the natural world, so we are all drawn back to her. So know that and don't be afraid. Like, there's mountain lions aren't going to get you. Let's just be honest. If you're yeah. walking a poodle and you're at, you know, there's a chance your poodle might disappear if you let it off a leash because that happens quite a bit. But, like, the animals aren't out there to hurt you. There are not secret robbers in the woods that are waiting to jump and take your money. Yeah. There's guys like me out there maybe walking with loincloths, and if you see me bathing in a stream, just give a <laughs> wave because it's happened. But, like, right. the, the, the natural environment is a very safe place if you educate yourself to it. So don't be afraid of it. Actually embrace it. Take the time to understand the weather and the natural flora and fauna and your appreciation, your understanding will grow immensely. And before you know it, your respect will grow for it to keep it clean, to keep it safe, to keep it safeguarded and to make sure that it's, it's preserved for our kids and our kids, kids, because we're just borrowing it. That's all we're doing right now. Exactly. I'm 40, you're 40. I need to make sure my kids and their kids have the opportunity to say my grand. That's what's most important yeah, to me is I, I feel like it's part of my heritage. It is, yeah. you know, because I, we don't, we're so we're such a melting pot now. It's mm -hmm. very common, uncommon that you meet somebody that's like, I'm 100 percent Italian. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nowadays, it just doesn't yeah, happen. Right. Yeah. And we have all these websites that you go to now to get your genealogy and it tells you you're this percentage of this. Yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> like, oh, my God, it can yeah. be overwhelming. Right. Yeah. So I think that we identify heritage a little bit more now with what we do in our family traditions For and sure. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really feel like the mountains are part of mine, and I just want to help preserve that the best that we can. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. And well, I think it's... we need to look at it collectively as a population that way. Yeah. Well, that's <clears throat> what's important is you're doing that exposure. You're bringing a greater audience to the mountains that might be visiting. They'll listen to the podcast and say, all right, hey, look, before we go, we're going to make it a little bit better. We might not live here, but we're going to vacation here for a couple of days. Sure. And that's what's important because – you know, we have such an influx and we are seasonal. Like it's nonstop between ski season and the summer and the spring. It's people yeah. are always coming here. And especially with the pandemic, because yeah. people are fleeing these cities where yep. they don't want to be around a lot of people and going to more remote places. Exactly. And I don't knock that by any means, man. I, I I'm don't all either. about it. I just, I just think that we need to take care of we do. Our, our places that uh, we enjoy. Yeah. And I, I think, it also comes, you know, one step further when it comes to, like, the, the hunters and the anglers in this state. Um, I think we need to bring more awareness to that for how much they actually provide resource-wise as far as manning trails and putting your little poop bags for your dogs. On some, I mean, that's All that where, stuff comes from oh, hunting yeah. licenses, yeah. Yeah, it's huge. And those hunters support some of the smaller economies, some of these small little mountain towns, the mom-and-pops breakfast joints and hotels and motels and sporting goods stores. Like, we need to really appreciate, I know the, the Hug a Hunter and Hug an Angler, you know, campaign is always big, but, like, that yeah. has to be a really popular 
um, and kind of a constant reminder in people's minds. Like when you're hiking on that trail and it's nice and clear and you've got a nice little bridge to walk over, it was somebody's hunting license and fishing license and their constant support and doing the right thing by getting licenses to hunt and fish that's building those bridges, maintaining 100%. those trails. And it, it does so much. I mean, it's such a ripple effect, even for uh, cattle ranchers and stuff. Yeah. A lot of them in that off season where they can't send their cattle to market or whatever, mm -hmm. they turn into outfitters and yeah. they take people hunting on their private land exactly. and, and stuff like that. So I, it, it impacts a lot. And um, I don't want to dive into this too long and we're kind no. of coming up on our time an hour and yeah. a half flew by. I feel like Man, we could I got, do like five hours. I got nowhere you. else to be. So you do you, I got nowhere else to go. <laughs> I want to get your take on yeah. this uh, because I feel like you're probably more connected to nature than anybody oh, I appreciate it. Uh, that I know firsthand um and you spend a ton of time outdoors and you know that the animals and the species that probably better than most av your average hunter does even right because you are eating things that the average person probably wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah um you know that's what concerns me about gray wolves being uh Introduced. we already have gray wolves here that have yep. migrated in from wyoming mm -hmm. and that sort of thing uh, but they're kind of being I wouldn't say reintroduced. They're, they're being introduced or they're being repopulated. They I are. Guess, yeah. Is, Absolutely. is what they're planning on doing. And it's coming up on this ballot initiative and I never dive into politics, yeah. and, but this is something that impacts mountain life, I think. Absolutely. And, uh, I just kind of wanted to get your take on it and your opinion matters yeah. to me. Oh, I appreciate um, it. And we're going to have people from both sides of the fence on, uh, uh, I'm working on that right up till November. We're going to have a few more episodes cool. based on that. And actually, spoiler alert, the next one that we're recording is with a biologist oh, right um, out of Castle Rock. And cool. he's super involved with the gray wolf reintroduction um, and and uh, how that game and fish is going to kind of go forward with it. Um, <clears throat> So I just kind of wanted to get yeah. your take and what you thought. Is there room for another apex predator here and the influx in people? And that's that's yeah. kind of my concern. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm really I'm on the fence. I from the natural way I see a value to it, but maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago in the state with today with the with the population density that we have because I always think I always tell people half of our state is you know mountains. And the majority of our population is along that front side of those mountains. And where do all those people go? Into the mountains every weekend. So we don't, we don't have the land kind of sp the, the population spread out like we do in some states. Mm -hmm. All of ours is really condensed. It's to the very front. concentrated, yeah. So knowing that, that means those people are going to be heading into the bush because that's what Colorado is. So it, it brings a little concern to me that people are going to go into a state of fear. And from that fear, there's going to be more firearms carried up in the mountains. And everyone's right to, you know, here it's an open carry state. I don't ever carry one. Um, I don't see a need for it. And that's just not my, my personal thing. But I, I fear those things are going to happen. There's going to be more firearms carried for defensive measures against wolves. And people are just going to be aimlessly shooting around. And there could be me taking a dump in the bushes or some family picnicking around a bend. So I, I, I fear that kind of like. That's a great point because yeah. that hasn't been brought up on the podcast yet. Yeah. And uh, I think that, I mean, I've been shot at by other hunters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Me. And uh, I'm like. Why? How? You didn't even see. Yeah. Like, I was always taught. Well, they teach you this in hunter safety. Yeah, target shoot, acquisition. So, yeah. Geometry is a fire. Yeah. Where's my target? What lies behind it? You know? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, so. so that that definitely is a concern of mine because even with my dog, any dog, any husky, anything. Oh yeah. There's gonna have we're gonna have all these accidents. There's gonna be all these problems, and I. That's just me on like the selfish side. Like, all right, I don't want to be shot at. I don't want my dog shot at. I don't want people shot at. And then when it comes to kind of to the biological scientific side. Um, this is, sounds kind of, you know, crazy, but if they don't exist now, you know, through us as the high, the apex species here, um, then they shouldn't necessarily exist right now, if you know what I mean. Like, they've they've been ruled out. We've hunted them, and the, yes, they haven't had their opportunity to flourish, but I don't think bringing them back is going to give the same result that we would want. Well, we would and want part like of the problem is, is that I found out in the last podcast that I did on wolves is it's not the species that was originally here. The exactly. gray wolf is much larger. Yeah. 
Um, it's it's a much more of an apex predator. Yeah. Um, and coyotes have grown larger because that wolf is now gone, right? Exactly. A coyote used to be a lot smaller it's like animal. A, the size of a fox. Now almost, you yeah. see them, and they're the they're a small wolf. So yeah. they have turned into that that um, I guess B class predator. Sure. I don't know how you would classify them. They're not they're not as uh, effective as a mountain lion or a bear per se, like a grizzly or something yeah. like that, which we yeah, don't have grizzlies yeah. here, but, but that kind of brings up my next point. Like what's next. Okay. So we're going to bring gray wolves. Are we going to bring grizzlies back? It's game over. You know what I mean? Like what's, yeah. It, and you just, you got to look at some of these other States like Idaho and Wyoming and some of the issues that they've had and, and the numbers that they're, that they reintroduce there. Mm-hmm. And what they've grown to already, and the yeah. numbers, we really need to watch the numbers that they're talking about putting yeah. here, too. And I've heard all kinds of different things. I've heard 1,000, 500. Yeah. I've heard 60. I've heard, you know, one side of the fence says one thing and the other says yeah. another. But, And I'm trying to I'm trying to be as neutral as possible and sure. make people or let people make their own decision. But it really scares me that it's at the ballot box. I know. It <laughs> like, looks- why isn't it down to experts like... I would consider you an expert and somebody because you spend so much time in, in the, the woods bush. Sure. And, and the bush and, and stuff like that. And I, I I feel like it should be a culmination of those people, biologists, scientists, making yeah. that decision with Game and Fish. And Game and Fish has unfortunately put on a gag order to where they can't speak on it. You know, yeah. and it, those are the, the people that we should be leaning on the most. Yeah. So I really am hoping and I hope if you're listening to this before you go to the ballot box, that you educate yourself, and sure. I hope that you actually do vote on it. For sure. Uh, yeah. You know, one way or another. I don't I don't care. I know how I feel and how I'm going to vote For on sure. it. But I just think people should educate themselves on the entire thing. So that's what I'm going to try to help the general yeah. public do. And I think having these conversations with people like you is it. critical, too. Yeah. So I think it comes down to ground truth. You know, what is the ground truth when uh, a wolf population is going to be reintroduced or introduced? And... The, the ground truth is we have created an entire food source for it through our livestock. So the idea that those wolves are going to be mingling in the mountains and working and hunting moose and elk, and they're not. Mm-hmm. They're going to drop to the lower elevations or the valleys, and they're going to take out the populations of easy, easy prey. They're smart. Yeah. They get it. Why were we going to spend days stalking or doing this X, Y, and Z when we can just take out that farmer? Well, and a lot of the and elk the population and that's stuff where like they that, go. that's where they go to yeah. winter. So yeah. they're... They're going to end up there. I mean, yeah. if they can migrate out of the Tetons or out of Yellowstone sure. through the Tetons, I mean, that is rugged country. That's that is terrain. another yeah. animal, right? Yeah. <laughs> of, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, I mean, <sighs> we have spots like that in Colorado, but not to that extreme, I no. don't think, in vastness. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I heard a crazy statistic, too, and not to bring this up again, but for anybody that's listening, but uh, Montana, Wyoming – and I think it might, I think it was Montana and Wyoming is a third combined is a third of the population of what we have in Colorado right now. Oh, and the land mass is like 10 to 12 times the size. Wow. And my facts could be wrong on some of this. So mm-hmm. don't, but it's something around those, those deals. So you just do the math Yeah. when you have that many people here and. There's going to be encounters. Oh, there's going to be huge yeah. encounters. There already is encounters. I think there was one that was hit on I-70. Really? But anyways, we're, we're going to dive into that in the next couple podcasts sure, and stuff yeah. like that. And, uh, I just hope people are listening and paying attention. Absolutely. But I, I really value your opinion. Oh, I appreciate and it. <laughs> I th- thanks for sharing. I, yeah, I know no it's worries. a touchy subject right now. but Yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's a balance. Uh, ground truth. I would like to just see more ground truth on, on what it's going to – what the, the outcomes – what are they looking to obtain? Yeah. You know, what what is that truth? What are they what are they trying to find? Well, and there's so many other issues that we're dealing with too right now in the world. You know, it's I know. like I feel like it's just gonna kinda slip past and it's just gonna yep. what I don't want it to be is just that check yes or no, like, oh yeah. I don't know. I guess I wolves yeah. are cool. Yeah, I love you know? wolves. Okay. Yeah. Wait for your next hike and you're walking <laughs> your lab. <laughs> there's three scout wolves yeah. and you know, they're like, We've got them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Different so. story. Different well, story. We'll see how it all goes yeah. down. But Donnie man, yeah. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Why don't uh, before we jump off, can you tell us what's next for you? You got anything coming up? You got any schools or classes yeah. or so, movies or Yeah, September is really a jam packed month. Um I have uh, some napping I'm going to be doing with another napper, and then I'm going to go to this uh, nice lady. She has this 
big farm, 800 acres uh, with some kids and some family members. I'm going to be going out there working with them specifically, uh, showing them how to resource their own land, hunt, trap, fish, kind of survive. You know, this is, I don't want to say this is in response to COVID, but there's a lot of people these days that are looking to go a little bit more simplistic in life. And they're reaching out to people like myself to say, how do I tan a hide? How do I forge? How do I do these things? This has been a great reset for a lot of people to find themselves, I think. Absolutely. So I've got uh, that going on in September. And then, you know, the end of September into October, I'll be supporting another uh, feature film out that's being filmed in Virginia. It's going to be a horror film, so it should be. (laughs) Backwoods of Virginia. Yeah, pretty much. I'm like, all right, I'm going to carry it. It's got to be Rob Zombie, please. (laughs) If it's Rob Zombie, call me. I will. I'll take some some photos. All right, cool. And then, uh, yeah, that's kind of of it. And then once uh, October hits, I'm going to hit the bush for a good uh, long haul. A lot of good seasons are popping up right then. So I got a couple series of caves I'll be living in and moving in, myself and Finn. We're going to cool. be doing some of our own little projects, and uh, yeah, just life is long, so I'm not in a hurry to to try to like figure it all out. And just as it comes, it comes, and enjoy the enjoy the time, enjoy the days. Awesome, man. Yeah, man. So, uh, if people wanted to reach out to you or learn about the school, do yeah. you, I know that you have a website. I do, and you're on Instagram. I am. Do you want to drop all those sure, so people for sure. know how to get a hold of you? Yeah, I appreciate it. So, my website is uh, paleotracksurvival.com. Um, that is just kind of the information site for my school when I'm running courses, uh, different uh, offerings that I'm running. Uh, you can also kind of follow what I'm doing on DonnieDust.com. That goes into any recent publications or films or TV shows. That's just kind of an information sort of thing. Um, and then on Instagram, it's just regular uh, Donnie Dust. Uh, I'm on the Facebook as well. All those social yeah, media Yeah, I things. highly urge you, go follow <laughs> Donnie on Instagram, uh, man. Appreciate. You're going to get some cool shit, like, at least once a week, if not every day. You just, like... Yeah. I, I don't know if you've seen us comment on your stuff, I have. but no, I it, it's it. really cool, man. So. Yeah. I need to, I don't, I don't post all the time cause I'm not all the time available to post, but when I'm in and around, uh, I'll, I like to post stuff. But what you to, put out is good. Oh, and that's actually it. how we started conversing. Yeah, so it's a great way to get a hold of you and you Absolutely. were super responsive and I appreciate that. Yeah. So. And that's, that's a big thing for me. So if you have questions, ideas, comments, concerns, whatever about anything, survival, primitive skills, or just, recommendations i am pretty obtainable you know if if i don't respond to you i'm probably out in the bush but uh that's one of my personal goals is to be reachable and be a source of information so if you got questions you know fire them out and if i can answer them i will and if i don't know an answer i will definitely try to point you in the right direction and uh, give you some of that insight through somebody else so awesome yeah dude all right thank you again man it was really awesome man sure you're you're welcome back anytime i appreciate it (laughs) anytime you want to come back to civilization (laughs) we're we're right here for you buddy so but uh but carly you doing okay back there i'm sorry we haven't talked to you the whole show uh, no worries. Uh, yeah, I'm, ex- I'm excited to check out those survival shows now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going to go on a bender. <laughs> right on. For sure. Well, so. just look for my mug on the Netflix one. You can't, <laughs> you can't miss it. You can't miss it. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. Donnie, thanks for your time and bringing your new pup. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you for all the support that we have out there. And we truly appreciate all of our Mountainside listeners. If you haven't had a chance to do this already, please like, follow, comment, subscribe, wherever you catch the Mountainside podcast. Your support is greatly appreciated. Also, if you'd like some more information on the podcast, please check out our website at themountainsidepodcast.com.